Well, hello everyone, and this is the Wide Open Talk Show. Um, this is episode two, and today is Tuesday, April the 5th, 2016. I am joined, as always, by my good friend, Mr. Sam Lewis. How are you doing today? It's uh, it's Tuesday. What, what you got going on? Doing fantastic. Other than dealing with some governmental things that isn't necessarily for me to vent on here that has given me a freaking headache and I'm still not done with. I'll just I'll just leave it at that for now. <laughs> <laughs> Might rhyme with unemployment, just saying. Oh, <laughs> really? Really? Nothing? Oh, yeah. It's not like I know anything about that. Mm. It's not like you follow me on Snapchat. Heck no. <laughs> no, of course not. Um. Uh, well, it's it's been kind of a quiet day here, so um, not a lot going on. But uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the show. This is a live call-in show, and of course, we'd love your opinions on anything that we're talking about today. And, and of course, don't be shy. Don't be bashful. Um, if you just want to get something off your chest, that's fine. It doesn't have to coincide with exactly what we're talking about, uh, even though that'd be great if you got an opinion on you know, whatever topic we happen to be talking about. So that number is 229-518-3525. That is 229-518-3525. And uh, I want to kind of start off with something that we don't even really have in the in the show notes, but you kind of actually inadvertently touched on it a little bit when okay. you started off with unemployment. Okay. And it's about identity. Um, you know, you and I, and and of course our mutual friends and our our uh, Slack chat, have actually talked about this somewhat. But I, I I got to thinking about it even more this morning, and I don't know where I want to go with this, but it's it's about identity and how. I don't know about you, but I think this is. This is the way I am, and I think you are are too, and I think it affects a lot of people this way, but our identity is closely tied with what we do most of our waking moments. And what I mean by that is, you know, I take me, for example, for the longest time, my identity was I was I was the guy that ran a cable broadband company. You know, I didn't necessarily identify as a father of three fantastic children, a husband to a a bodacious bitchin' wife, not bitchin' as in bad, but bitchin' (laughs) as in good. Um, I never really identified with those things. I always identified as my, my person was always intrinsically tied to the fact that I was the general manager of a cable broadband company. And, you know... Over the last five years or so, I've gone through what I could only describe as an identity crisis because I found myself no longer that guy, and I was kind of wondering, you know, I was I was on a rudderless ship, so to speak, and then I had to kind of identify back to, well, I'm a guy that works for a plastic extrusion company, but I never really wanted to identify. That just, that just felt soul-crushing. Not that it wasn't something I needed at the time. It's just not who I was. And of course, now I'm, I'm an, a self-employed uh, business owner trying to make his way uh, in IT consulting. And I'm, I think I'm still having an identity crisis. I mean, do you, do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, do you, do you, I don't think it's a secret that, you know, you're, you're temporarily laid off right now. I think that's right. a given. Oh yeah, it's public. <laughs> so, I mean, how do you feel about that? Uh, there, I have been dealing with a bit of a. The thing is, my job has never been the thing that really identifies me. I suppose I could say because, well, the main thing that ties me into my identity, and hilariously enough, a lot of people have even sort of my friends and family wise sort of tuned into this and that's the sort of thing they'll say about me now is that it really is like my content creation because I feel that it's kind of my to <laughs> to get into being a bit spiritual I won't go too far down the rabbit hole but no, it is fine. it is kind of my calling in life to make this content and stuff like that so it, it has gotten to the point to where some people will say that about me before they'll even say other 
aspects of me. He's like, you know, he's a podcaster and stuff like that. And kind of makes me feel good <laughs> that they'll say that first before they'll say some of the other possibilities. Not that those are bad possibilities, yeah. but it's nice to know that I'm known for that. And people are even used to ideas like, oh, no, something we could say could inspire him on one of his shows to talk about it, you know, and things like that. And they're perfectly fine with that. Not kind of like in the the way they bring it up in on No Agenda between uh, Dvorak and, and Adam. But it's like, oh, he's just a podcaster. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 more respectful and less, oh, one of those, you know, sort of yeah. thing. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so but my identity is really at this point, and it was something that I had to find. I've been doing this for five years now, and I guess yeah, longer I, than me. Yeah, <laughs> and whenever I first started, I was not as solid in this identity as I was now. In fact, you and me met through um, a mutual acquaintance of ours, Cliff Ravenscraft. He yeah. made a mastermind of podcasters. Mm -hmm. And when I started, I, I always sort of, if someone asked me this, I take that group and I give them a lot of credit. All of the people that were ever part of group four, you were, you know, you're part of that credit. Mm -hmm. um, but I was so shaky in that identity of me doing online content. I knew I was supposed to be doing it. I knew that it was sort of my calling, but I don't know. I wasn't solid in it yet. And it might have taken that group of people, you and all the other ones, to sort of go, oh, no, you can do this. You're good at this. Just quit second-guessing yourself, dude. You know? <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I totally went through that identity crisis. I think everybody at some point goes through that. I, I don't even think it's an age thing. I mean, mm. I had a friend that recently – a couple of months ago, got his own home finally for the first time. And he suddenly went through that crisis of, well, now I'm not home, so there are certain things I'm not doing anymore. Those things were kind of the things I was identifying with now. And all of a sudden, they're not there. So I, I think as we go through life, we sort of have these identity crises bit by bit. It doesn't mean that we're wrong on anything or so to speak i think just as human beings we change we regenerate we turn into different mm -hmm. people and and we're limited to 13 regenerations yes unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> unless the time lords give us another one um, right. but but yeah it's that that is the metaphor that pops into my mind is what the what the eleventh doctor said, if I can remember all of it. We all change if you think about it. We all become different people, and that's good. You, you've got to keep on moving, but you never forget who you used to be. Mm -hmm. So, our identities are like that in a very big way, where we are a person, and then suddenly we're not a person anymore. I <laughs> I look back at the person I was in high school up until the very end when certain things started happening. I'll I'll say more middle school mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. I was I was a smart ass. There's, <laughs> there's <laughs> no there's no, <laughs> there's no nice way to put it. I was a bit of a jerk back in the day. And I I'm, I'm glad that I was able to find less of a jerkish identity. I mean it was and I think that might have been part of Everyone goes through this, right? Where you're trying to figure out who the heck you are, you know, talking about identity. And I, I eventually found myself, and luckily myself was a bit less of a douche. So, <laughs> um, Well, you know, it, it takes a really big man to, uh, <laughs> to self-deprecate like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. But no, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, totally. But yeah, that's the stuff that we go through, and I think that everyone is due a couple of identity crises where you sort of change over time, environments change, times change, stuff like that, and you just go through it. And again, there's nothing wrong with you going through it. It's just part of the process. Yeah, it's just how many freaking times can you go through it is <laughs> is the question. I mean, it, it, it starts getting really kind of uh, – it gets, gets kind of old, I mean – I, you know, it's like, well, 
I, and I guess the biggest thing that affected me was the fact that I never really thought about the future insofar as, okay, what am I going to do in 15 years or 20 years or 30 years down the road? You know, it. I, I was complacent, number one, which was probably not a good thing because that that has a tendency to lead you down uh, an arrogant path, I guess. Mm. You know, I'm complacent, I'm untouchable, blah, 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 and then suddenly you find out you're not. Mm. And um, so, you know, I'm not saying that all of the things that I've had to go through in the last few years weren't unwarranted and they were probably needed uh, to change my character up a little bit because... I'll be the first to tell you that I, I'm an only child, so I already had that stigma attached to me. I had that mm-hmm. arrogance attached to me, and the fact that I, I didn't come from a well-off family, but I came from a, a decently well-off family. Let's put it that way. I mean, my father worked for General Motors, so, and being an only child, unfortunately, if Donovan wanted something, Mama acquiesced. <laughs> which is not good, not uh-huh. good at all. So, you know, going through my, my teens and my, my 20s, you know, having children was the first thing that tempered me. Um, I, I would have been completely out of control if it hadn't have been for them. So they, they tempered me somewhat, but it wasn't until I fell flat on my face after 13 years of what I thought was going to be basically my career and finding that that wasn't going to be it. That was a change that I needed. I, I tried to look at it in a positive light, but you still get that doubt that creeps in. It's like, okay, I, I feel like I'm having like three or four false starts here, and mm-hmm. and I just I, I get tired of it. I guess, and I guess that's the reason why I wanted to talk about it a little bit. Is it was kind of weighing on my mind this morning. I went down, to, you know, went down to the post office. I've been waiting on a couple of checks from some clients, and and. uh they weren't there, so I was getting irritated with that, and, um, you know, the morning didn't start off all that well. My wife and I had a little bit of a disagreement, but, you know, that, that happens. I mean, we're coming up on 26 years next month being married. Mm. So, and and you were the most, I figured, the pointed person to talk about this with because of the fact that, you know, suddenly, you know, you're... Every your your normal day to day routine has now been disrupted, and mm. you, and you really don't see. I, I I guess you don't. I mean, we haven't talked about it, but you don't really see like an immediate change to that. Even though it'd be nice if there was one, <laughs> right? Yeah. So uh, you know that that's the reason why I was curious. You know, did it affect your how you viewed yourself? You know, did it affect your identity, um, or even like with podcasting? You know, does it does it have a tendency to affect affect you in in that regard saying well you know i really want to i really want to create this content and like you know like today you know second day you and i are doing this at 2 p.m. in the afternoon um but do you ever start having second thoughts about well i need to be doing something else that could be classified as more productive or furthering what i need to do to make sure that my livelihood's going to be you know, here in the next few weeks. I mean, does that ever creep into your mind or you just kind of, and, and and I'm not playing the religion card by any means, but do you just, as they say, <laughs> put it in the hands of God and say, it's going to work out? I I do that a bit. I, I sometimes need to do it more than I do. I'd be a little bit less stressed out if I, <laughs> if I actually went around and done that. Um, <laughs> I'll admit, the past couple of weeks, I have been and apparently noticeably, (laughs) slightly a bit more touchy than, (laughs) I guess is the best word to put it, um, than I normally have been. And it's mainly been because this whole process of going through the way that the unemployment system in Tennessee, because even though I live in Kentucky, the job that I was working in was in Tennessee. It's right across the, I live right on the border where Williamsburg Mm -hmm. is right near the border of Tennessee and Kentucky. So the job that I worked in was in a town called Jellicoe, the next town over. You know, that never occurred to me that you were having to go through the Tennessee Department of Labor and not Mm -hmm. the Kentucky. 
which I have been through the Kentucky before, and it's a fantastic system. That's, I guess that's a bit why I am so frustrated with the Tennessee one, because I've been through the Kentucky one before, because the job that I was working used to be in Kentucky until they merged us with the Jellico plant. And as a result, I guess I have that greener on the other side <clears throat> perspective. Mm -hmm where I can see how a good labor system can be built versus the one I'm going through right now. Hey, I understand that I was surprised um, in 2012 when I went and filed, and I say went, I went online and mm -hmm. filed everything necessary for, for my uh, unemployment. And I was shocked, shocked at how easy it all was to do it online. Mm -hmm. Um the only thing that got me was the fact that, um, and I guess you could just never take a complete hands-off approach, but what got me was after I filed everything, and of course I got a letter that said, hey, we need you here in person, blah, 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 and uh, and I, I really was dreading that, and so I went up there, and uh, what should have been like a, a five-minute in, five-minute out ordeal wound up being an, an hour-long wait and the lady come out and apologize because she didn't even realize I was there, even though I'd mm. gone through the proper check-in procedures. Um, and because I had not been employed for almost 20 years, I actually was required to go through uh, workshops. Hmm. I had to, every, every two weeks or every four weeks, I had to go up there and sit through a 45-minute workshop. And if I didn't, then my benefits were denied. But... As far as, you know, every Tuesday morning, I had to do what they call certify. So, you know, that's where I put in the jobs that, you know, I tried to get. I put that information in, and then my my uh, unemployment was direct deposited by the next Friday. So mm. I say all that to say this. Yes, I understand what a very good automated system is. To me, whenever I've actually had to be on the phone and talk to somebody at the Department of Labor, I'd just rather you go ahead and cut my throat. <laughs> because honestly, none of them, with the exception of that first woman that I met face to face, none of them were nice. They all treated me like I was lower than dirt, like everything was my fault, and why in the hell were they even having to waste their time with me? Mm. And that was the part that I just absolutely hated about it. Now, I'm presuming your experience, because you've had to call a couple of times, has been completely different than that. Yeah. Weirdly enough, the website is giving me more problems than the people are. I mean, the the support people that have called me and have been helping me have been the sweetest people you've ever had to deal with in your life. It's fantastic. Um, right now, I am stuck in a nice little rule limbo where I can do it online, but for my first time, I have to call them. Mm. And I have tried... To get through this morning, the reason why my brain was a bit mushy and pre-show I mentioned a name when normally by our rules I would never mention a name if I don't have permission because uh, it just slipped out. <laughs> the reason why is because I sat this morning for an hour redialing the phone number and redialing the phone number. And the reason why I had to redial the phone number because they didn't have a waiting system installed, which means you... Tell them you want to speak English. <laughs> and that, well, that's the first thing of any automated system. Right. I know. Dial one for English. It's unfortunate, <laughs> but yes. It did sound a bit blunt, didn't it? I, didn't <laughs> yeah. mean it that I like that. <laughs> Tell um, them I want to speak English. <laughs> um, then I put in my social security number. Uh, then they informed me my account was previously locked, which I know of. Mm -hmm. I've been dealing with this whole thing. And in fact, my reason for calling is to fix that very thing, and only they can do it via the call. To set up a PIN number, that way I can do it online for the rest of the time. Funny thing is you go through all that, and then it says, please wait for the next available representative. And it says, I'm sorry, all of our representatives are currently busy. <laughs> and then they tell it tell me I can go on the website, which in my case, I can't. I have to <laughs> talk to the people. And then they say goodbye and hang up. Oh, Wow. At at some point, 
I figured out actually that I could sort of pull a brushwood and hack the system a bit Mm -hmm. where since I know what buttons to press at this point, I don't have to sit there and listen to all of the automated things to where I can just go one. And then as soon as that starts, put my social security number in, press the pound sign, and then at least go through that last part over and over again, instead of having to wait about five minutes to get through everything, them telling us that in the future, this system will be obsolete and there will only be the online thing. In future reference, you may want to consider trying the online portal. Well, I would love to try the online portal, <laughs> but you told me to use the phone. <laughs> I was going to say, in the future, what does that mean? I mean, are they going to tell you... I don't understand that. I mean, you know, it's great. Okay, yeah, use the online. But even, I mean, this is like when my wife would tell me, well, you know, this is where we rely too heavily on technology. And, of course, mm-hmm. we get into all these debates. But right, use the online system. Well, the online system is broken. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because they were t- they're pretty much warning that anyone that uses the phone system, in the future, the phone system will not exist, and we're going to have to just use the online portal, which is fine, fine, as whatever. long as it works. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, and and the weird thing about Tennessee is that they closed all of their physical offices of the Department of Labor. You cannot go to a physical office except in Tennessee, except in Nashville. Wow. That's the only one. And you know how far I live away from Nashville. We've had this discussion before. Yeah, but not only that, but if if they basically consolidated down from, I don't know, 10 or whatever down to one, mm-hmm. can you imagine the number of people that are probably there? Right now? Yeah. yeah. That's, that is scary, isn't it? <laughs> Jeez. It. It's it's them wanting to set it up to where they've just got the online system and that's how it works. And I get that. I really do. But even as techie people, people that do a tech podcast on Friday, me and you both sort of look at this and go, that may be a bit too far. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, you've always got to have that that balance where – because even here in Tifton, and granted – They've they've done some consolidation because there used to be one over, I'm pretty sure there used to be one over in Ben Hill County, which is where I'm originally from. But pretty much the one in this region is in Tifton, Georgia. And, you know, they've they've got I'd say probably somewhere in the neighborhood of about eight or ten computers because, okay, a lot of this stuff is online. So if you aren't computer savvy, number one, or you don't yeah. own a computer, then you can go up to the Department of Labor and sit there, and they'll they'll assist you in like filling out uh, applications online and stuff like that. Because pretty much ninety nine point nine percent of all companies now only do job applications online, mm. and uh, with the exception of a few. And I mean, even then, you you go and sit down in front of a computer or a kiosk at the location and still yeah. fill it out that way. Um. But going to a completely online system, to me, is very detrimental to the the less educated and the less fortunate. So mm-hmm. it's it's almost like an arbitrary tax that you're placing an undue burden on these people. Uh, I mean, they're, they're already in a world of crap as it is because they're they're unemployed, and you're making it even more difficult for them, mm-hmm. even though under the guise of making the system more efficient. Right. <laughs> that that just boggles my mind. I mean, that's got to be Republican-led. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, all I, can, all I can say is, so you haven't been able to actually get to anybody today. No, because I've... It's. I've been. Oh, I, I have trauma just thinking about it. I I was sitting there for about an hour just calling over and over and over because again, there's no waiting system. It just hangs up on you if everyone's busy. So, which I I almost have this theory where I wonder how many people they have working on this system, given they're about to make it obsolete. Mm-hmm. It would almost make you wonder if they didn't have the least amount of people legally possible <laughs> doing it, 
which would mean I'm probably never going to get through to these people. And I'm just going to have to, at the end of the day, send them another support email that says, well, I've been calling all dang day and I can't get through. What yeah. am I supposed to do? What, do you, what do you expect me to do? We'll try again tomorrow. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, I know. And I've even I've even had to apologize to mom so many times because I've been so grumpy during all of this. I, just... <laughs> I can imagine it's frustrating and it's stressful because, I mean, un, un, I, I'm presuming that until you get this sorted out, you don't get any money. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, huh, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's, it's stressful. I, I, I definitely get that. Yep, and... You you check in every week, and you are required to find three jobs a week. Yeah. So that's that's the other setup, which, again, you said a lot of things are online now, so that's mainly where I've been doing my things mm -hmm. is online. So I did that, too. Luckily. Ours was um, ours was two a week, mm. and then I got into what was called – I forget the actual acronym, but it was uh, it was the extended unemployment that was kicked in by the federal government. And when I got into that, that's whenever I was about to have to go into seeking three jobs a week. And mm. fortunately for me at that time, uh, an old friend of mine who... Um, worked at the company that I used to work at, the Plastic Extrusion, extrusion Company, we kind of touched base again. He actually kind of found me through a podcast, of all things, and mm. uh, he wound up offering me a job again, so I didn't have to go through all of that. And, of course, you know, I worked there for a little over two years, and then he did cost-cutting. I didn't even go through. Um, I attempted to go through the Department of Labor this time around and do unemployment, but they – they they kind of look down their nose at you when they say, well, what what are you doing right now? And I said, well, I'm actually working for myself. Oh, you're working for yourself? <laughs> yeah, but that doesn't mean that I'm making, you know, buku money here. Well, yeah, but you don't qualify. Have a good day. <laughs> and and that, was, that was pretty much it. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well. Hopefully, after we we get finished with today's show, maybe you can get back into you know Robo Dial <laughs> mode and <laughs> and finally get to some somebody anyway. Yeah, I'm planning on doing that as soon as the show ends. Can we make it longer this week? <laughs> this today? Sure, sure. Let's I'm see, kidding, but... four o'clock. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, we can we can dribble on. I might have to take a bathroom break, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I guess to wrap that topic up so, somewhat is that's. I've actually had thoughts that if and and I I'm I'm stressed out because I don't want to give up the autonomy that I have of being self-employed for the security of actually having quote unquote a full-time job. Right. Um there's something in my brain that says, well, you would have less stress if you were in a full-time job because well, you're not concerned about, uh, well, is so and so going to pay you this week? Or then, you know, cash flow is is always an issue when you're self-employed, right? But the downside to that, and this is exactly what I ran into, and if I'd have realized what was happening, I would have done some things to change it. But when I was gainfully employed, working for uh, the city of Tifton and making damn good money, it was a soul-sucking job because it was not. <laughs> There was no challenge, you know. Right. I mean, I walked in. I was in charge of eighteen to twenty people. I made sure that all the supervisors made sure that what projects needed to be taken care of were taken care. Of. We had a well-oiled machine, which means, and I was told by a consultant, well, I should actually be, you know, in a larger system. I'd be riding around schmoozing with all the city managers and shaking hands with. Well, uh, you know, with the elected officials and stuff like that, and I would have been more of a political animal, mm -hmm. but I was in a, a a small town, rural, rural small town. Even though uh, Tifton and Tift County is about forty five thousand people, uh, we we were a one city system. There was really nobody for me to be political with, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, I, I say all that to say this: I had that. 
at one time. So here I am sitting on the other side of the fence going, well, I'd probably sleep a little better at night if I could just get up and, you know, punch the clock and then go home. But the problem is I know that if I did that, I'd give myself three months and I'd want to shoot myself. Uh And so it's a constant battle of trying to keep this identity of you're not a slacker, you're not a loser, you, you are a breadwinner, things have changed, your circumstances have changed. I consider myself somewhat of a house husband now because I do, I do go and buy groceries a lot because my wife, actually, she works uh, anywhere from 18 to 25 hours a week. And so she, I actually wind up having more free time unless we get a big project from a client. Mm. So, and even at that, if I'm, if I go and work for a client three hours every day, I still have a lot of free time. So there's definitely some, some positives for being self-employed, but it's scary as hell. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) And, and then this whole identity thing where I'm like, you know, I I have, I have to force myself, I get up, I'm like, you're going to get dressed today. Well, you don't have any appointments, get dressed anyway. (laughs) Because of one of two reasons. One, there's a very good chance, a possibility that you might get a call and, well, you won't already be dressed. Number two, it's mental. You know, I'm getting up, going to the quote unquote office, even though my office is technically out here in the studio. Right. Or at my workstation in the house. So, I don't know. Some of these things, it's just, it's just, you get it off your chest. You want to talk about it. And maybe, maybe there are other people that listen to this, this show and, and they're like, you know what? I think I'm having the same damn problem. <laughs> you know, after I, um, after I found myself unemployed in 2012, I actually uh, started a podcast called, uh, I think, I, let's see, I, I started out with one name and then I changed the name to like fired into success or not that that one's I think that one's a different thing anyway uh I had some I'm trying to remember it I remember you doing it fired fired into freedom that was it fired into freedom I believe is what I called it I don't remember what I called it I think initially was like what I'm fired but that was (laughs) yeah so I changed the name of it I think I did about seven episodes and I actually had uh I I had a friend of mine and and someone who I I really look up to in the whole podcast and audio file world that we live in. And he said, you need to keep that going because there, there's a need for that. But Mm -hmm. I I just, I couldn't, I couldn't find the stamina or that creative ball of the, the eight ball, if you will, to try to figure out what every episode needed to be about. Mm. So, but it, it was enjoyable to do because I could bitch and gripe about, you know, the problems I had with like SNAP, which is, you know, food stamps, the issues. I, I mean, I told the story about the first time I went into the unemployment office and and how I, I was pretty sure that Lucifer was sitting over in the corner. <laughs> I mean, it, it was dreadful. It, it was dreadful. And I, I, I channeled a lot of that into the book 50 and Furious, mm. which is a fictional tale of about what happened after I got fired and all of that. So anyway, I guess we beat the hell out of that topic enough. <laughs> um, it was a good topic. <laughs> yeah, like I say, I hope I hope it helps somebody. And uh, and and if you're out there listening, uh, while we're doing this show live, you can call two two nine five one eight three five two five. Actually, have the number up on the screen this time. You believe that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right over there. <laughs> uh um, I would like to. Uh, look at this article real quick, uh, since we're kind of talking about jobs and unemployment and all of that, but you know, California and New York have actually uh, gone the route of upping the minimum wage. And, you know, that's yeah. been a big issue is yeah. this whole thing. It started off about $15 an hour is a living wage. And I know that there are opponents to this. There's, there's pros and cons. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of this this guy by the name of uh, Stephen Crowder. He is a, he's a comedian, but he's um, like a right wing Republican comedian. His website is called louder with Crowder. And I saw a tweet that he did earlier last week, I believe where he said, you're not entitled to a living wage. You're entitled to a wage 
that is adequate for the job that you are performing. And I'm like, I don't think you live in the 21st century, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, granted, it, it is a little difficult for me to say that uh, someone who is taking my order at McDonald's should be making $15 an hour, but I think they should be making at least 10 to 12 Maybe 15 should be, you know, for different types of positions and what have you. But, and, and that, you know, you get into the minutia there. Yeah, there's there's tiny little bits and bobs that go all over the place, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, and of course, we've had cities, not just, not states, but we've had cities that have actually increased their minimum wage because the federal government sets a minimum standard, but the states and even the cities can actually up that. They just can't go below it. Right. Well, now, California and New York have actually made moves. Uh, Governor Jerry Brown of California is, uh, is going to sign a bill or either has signed the bill to raise the minimum wage in the state to $15 an hour. And Governor Andrew Cuomo in New York has made a deal with state lawmakers to do the same. And of course, it's it's going to be a, a staggered type thing. Um, mm. You know, it's goes up X amount in 2018, and I think one of them either tops out at 2020 or 2022. Um, and if you happen to be a small business that has less than either 10 or 15 people, then you get an extra year. And honestly, that's been one of the biggest complaints that I've seen is is the the naysayers against raising the minimum wage are all like, well. You know, that's just going to stop people from getting hired for small businesses. However, the studies that I have seen over the last 12 to, to 18 months have actually shown that in the places that they raised the minimum wage, they had lower employee turnover and better quality employees. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, it kind of makes sense because... If you're offering someone seven twenty five or seven forty five an hour, guess what? You're only gonna get a seven twenty twenty five or, or seven forty five an hour employee. And mm -hmm. I don't mean to be derogatory about it. I'm just saying that's that's facts. That's the way yeah. it works. But if you're if you're if you do your due diligence and you say, look, this job starts out at Thirteen or fifteen dollars an hour, and you make damn sure that you get a qualified employee. That employee is worth that fifteen dollars an hour, and it's not about necessarily about skill sets. I mean, that's what everybody keeps saying. Oh, well, that's unskilled labor. Well, I don't, I don't know, <laughs> but have you checked the cost of college lately? <laughs> I mean, someone come, someone coming out with a master's or a bachelor's degree that cost them seventy five to one hundred twenty five thousand dollars still has a tendency to wind up finding themselves as waiters in some swanky restaurant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So it, I think we're going to find, <clears throat> and there's going to be a lot of uh, hand-biting, but we're going to find that this, this move of the minimum wage upward is going to be a very positive thing. And if we can get, you know, the, the people's candidate, Bernie Sanders, in as president, <laughs> <laughs> then it, it'll it'll all be good because you know me I'm I'm an advocate of basic income. Mm. I'm I'm a, a staunch advocate of basic income. I'd much rather we do away with unemployment. I say get rid of all the social programs, all of them, every single social program out there, with the exception of one or two that would still need to fill a void that basic income couldn't couldn't do. And mm. then we take all of the funds that we're using to fund all of those social programs, and we do a basic income. Where once you hit 18, 16 or 18, I'm thinking 18, you immediately start getting a basic income of somewhere around $1,500 a month or whatever. I mean, that number would have to be worked out. Right. And, you know, and, and of course, I can already hear people going, oh, my God, you really want a true welfare state. No. <laughs> That's not what this is about. This is about, this is the reason why I did the episode of The Slant where I called it the next, the, the, or the American Renaissance. Mm -hmm. Just think about it. If people aren't having to worry about where they're going to get money from to, to pay their rent or to pay their electricity or to buy food, 
then they are more apt to actually, okay, I, I would like to go get an education so I could find a good job. And of course, there's a whole other segment about what we got to do with education. But I can do that, or I have the luxury of staying home with the newborn, whether it's the mom or the dad, or I have the luxury of, yeah, I'll go, I'll go work a part-time job because when you get the job, your basic income doesn't go away. Mm. That basic income is supposed to be there for life. So I can afford, and, and if we do that, you don't need minimum wage anymore. Mm. Completely get rid of minimum wage. So then if you do want to go work 10 or 15 hours you know, washing cars or at a fabric store or maybe at a, a, a fast food restaurant, you know, you still get your $1,500 a month, but you also make maybe, you know, an extra seven, $8,000 a month. Mm. So now you got a total income of about $2,500 a month. To me, it makes all the sense in the world. People will call me an idiot. They'll call me a socialist. I don't care. I just, from, <laughs> from everything that I've read and the studies where they actually have actually done the basic income, you know, the other thing is, it's like, oh, well, if you give people free money, they'll just sit on their asses and not work. Guess what? In the actual places that they've tried it, they showed where the actual work ethic increased. People, act, more people actually went to work. Giving us a lesson in Freakonomics. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't stopping you. I was just saying that that's the basic principle. It's, it, it is sort of Freakonomics-esque where you'd think it would do one thing and it actually does the exact opposite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it defies – some people would say it defies logic and reason, but it just, it just works that way. Mm. So I don't know. What you want to talk about? Well, there <laughs> there was a, a couple of interesting things that came across my thing. Um, one of these, I happened to be headed somewhere with my grandmother and mother the other day, or the other day, a couple of hours ago. What am I saying? Ugh. My brain's mush. <laughs> well, you know, in some continuum, it could be the other day, I suppose. I suppose. <laughs> but before we... Before we put the Gregorian calendar in place, it would be another day because that would be a span of time. <laughs> um, there you go. But anyway, so apparently there was an interesting study that came out, and this may lead to talk of studies and stuff like that, but it was trying to find sociopathic tendencies in people. This was the sort of thing I thought you might get a kick out of, so <laughs> that's that's why I... Not, not saying anything about you, I mean, you like studies like this, so... True. Um, but anyway, it was apparently a study from the University of Michigan, and it was trying to look for a sign that a person might be a soci sociopath if they constantly do something. Do, do you want to just get – I got this off of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, so I'm going to play a little around with you. Do you want to guess what this tendency happened to be in uh, regards to what a person would do <laughs> every day that would make them a sociopath? Oh, let's see. So I'll, give you, I'll give you a hint. It's a common internet behavior, okay? I'll, I will let you get that hint. Otherwise, okay. it'd be too so, wide and broad, and I would consider that unfair. <laughs> all right, so it's something that a sociopath would do every single day. Mm -hmm. Or a common behavior. Common Not behavior. necessarily every single day, but doing this get, is a possibility that you may have sociopathic tendencies. <sighs> I'm thinking it's got to have something to do with either checking email or checking all of your social media feeds. Uh, that that would be a nice guess, but no, that's not it. You want to give yourself another shot? Okay. But you say it's it's related to the internet. Yes, it is internet related in a way. Porn. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not it. No. <laughs> That makes you something different, but no, it's, <laughs> it's sociopathic. Pound chicken, wow, wow. Anyway, um, I, you know, I'm at a loss. I mean, I, I was, I was thinking that it was, uh, I mean, you know, aside from looking at Tinder matches or something like that, I mean, 
Yeah, I'm at a loss. I give. Okay. Yeah, you got you got your three strikes, and that's good enough for Family Feud. So it's good. Enough. If it's good enough for Steve Harvey, it's good enough for. Um, yeah, with yeah. him and his slack jawed look, whenever they say something, he can't believe they actually said. Exactly. And then yeah. it's on the board. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Totally. Um, but no. Uh, apparently, what this behavior is is people who correct typos and grammar may have sociopathic tendencies. Grammar Nazis? <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. I live with a family full of sociopaths. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so here's the quote, and I'm going to read off of the script here that they... Because NPR actually takes their podcast and they transcribe them, which is interesting. So I'm going to read from what Peter Sagal on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me had to say. According to science, the urge to correct errors like that means you're a jerk. (laughs) Um, (laughs) The researchers took a group of 83 people and gave them all personality tests to sort them into what kind of person they are. So in other words, they figured out, well, are these people sociopathic or not before they then did the rest of this study so they knew what their sample group was. Mm -hmm. Um, And then they asked them to read and write various essays and talk about the content. Some of the essays had typos and grammatical errors, some didn't. And what they found is that the people who were open and kind and generally forgiving just talked about what was written in the essays, and they never really noticed the typos. It was the people that identified as asocial, introverted, crabby, unpleasant, that type of person that said, well, I can't read this. There's an apostrophe in the your when there shouldn't be. (laughs) (laughs) I love the writers over at Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, by the way. They they come up with some clever crap. But no, so this is a study which says that that person that corrected your grammar because they couldn't help themselves might be a bit of a sociopath while they're doing it. (laughs) Wow. That is, uh, like I said, I, I think I live with a family full of sociopaths. Oh, you can you can bring that up in the next family meeting. I'm sure that won't get you any negative points whatsoever amongst that crowd. <laughs> no, no, not none whatsoever. I might come in here with a knife sticking out of the side of my neck, but <laughs> wow, that is an interesting study, though. Yeah, and I I like how first they figured out what type of person the person was as a baseline before they just made the spurious assumption. Right? Mm-hmm. It's because it. Because a lot of the times, and I think we've talked about this before in regards to other studies, where you find out that that's the method they used for this? What <laughs> What the heck? I just, like like the one study that we talked about in Tech Slant last week, where it was a bunch of British yeah. millennials that didn't list sunlight as a major factor for them, and it was sponsored by a blinds company. Right. <laughs> You know, and it's 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 those tiny things like that that sometimes crop up, and you go, "Wait a minute, what?" It's very very much akin to you know a, a study that shows that uh, nine out of ten people prefer Windows ten over the latest version of Mac OS ten, and you're like, "Well, who paid for the study?" Oh, Microsoft, of course, yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, that. Or, or back in the day, nine out of ten doctors believe you should be smoking camels. <laughs> I know, right? You go back and you look at some of those commercials. That that just blows my mind. Yeah, and especially how sexist they were. A you, bit. Yeah. You, you've seen those where they spe- the the print ads where they uh, I forget one, but it's like the woman is actually is is actually over the guy's knee, and he's like acting like he's spanking her. And it basically, it's something to the effect of, you know, if you don't, if you uh, don't do this right for your husband or whatever, then you'll get a. Sp- I, I mean, it was. It's like, really, you won't get away with that today. <laughs> yeah, I know people. Uh, there would be some religious group going on, going, they're practicing bondage, and that's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, of Not course, like we don't do that in our household, but uh, but they're still practicing bondage. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say the Baptists would probably say that that's you know standard stuff, and that's the way you're supposed to do it. But <laughs> oh, jeez, oh! <laughs> it's in you're the gonna, Bible, right? <laughs> you're you're going to be the death of me one of these days, Donovan. People are just going to beat the door down, and I'll go. He said it, not me. Don't <laughs> yeah. you? 
Don't, I'm not, I'm only guilty by association. Don't kill me. <laughs> He's in Georgia. Go, go. <laughs> oh, well, let's, let me segue that then. Is that all you had about that article? Yeah, it was just a fascinating article that I really wanted to know what you thought about it because it was it was just neat that now I've got one more thing to go. Ah, oh, you're adorable. You're also probably a sociopath. So <laughs> <laughs> you're Dexter. Um, <laughs> so uh, either last week or week before, Mississippi has decided that they're going to jump on the bandwagon of. Um, and you have to. You, I'll apologize before I before I say this. They're going to jump on the bandwagon of ignorance, but um, they passed a religious freedom bill, um, you know, like several other states have done, North Carolina being one. And then, of course, they're <laughs> they're starting to see the economic uh, downturn that that has caused. The state of Georgia, Governor Deal actually got smart and did not sign it, the one that was going through here. But Mississippi has passed one, and of course, it's the LGBT community, it's, they're like, what? Um, it allows organizations to fire a person whose religious beliefs are inconsistent with theirs and gives businesses permission to deny services to gay and transgender people. And um, so the bill, I think, is supposed to be on the governor's desk this week. Mm. And uh, yeah, what I don't understand about this and, and, and this is somewhat telling when in North Carolina, where it got passed, the bill was passed, turned into law, and it it primarily had to do with bathrooms, of all things, yeah. you know. But, of course, the problem is, is whenever they do these bills, they add all this, they either add all this other stuff or they leave it so broad that it's open to interpretation and can be misused. Right. Yeah, that's the little trick that usually goes through. Someone will make a bill and then something that has nothing to do with what's going on in that little subsection Q here also says that we do this. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the uh, the attorney general of North Carolina said, no, I'm not going to defend it uh, because the governor is actually in North Carolina is actually being sued to have hmm. the, the law repealed. And so the attorney general of North Carolina is like, yeah, you're right. It's a terrible law. I'm not I'm, I'm not going to defend it. And and then we have Georgia, who get, the governor says, nope, not going to sign it. And but then we got Mississippi. And the governor there is is expected to sign it. Now, here's what I don't understand. As I, I and I. <laughs> This may sound funny, but I preach, quote unquote, this every time <laughs> on social media. You don't need a religious freedom bill per state. We actually have one at the federal level that did not even need to be passed back in the 90s. Mm. Because your religious freedom is already guaranteed in the First Amendment. Yeah. Now, my argument has been and always will be that... I will always do my best to stand up for, protect, defend, fight for, whatever, your right to free speech, to believe how you want to believe. Um, I, am, I am a Second Amendment advocate with uh, some caveats. Right, yeah. However, when you decide to go into business— your religious beliefs no longer factor in because when you go into business, you go into business to provide services to any and all persons. Doesn't matter what color they are. Doesn't matter what gender they are. Doesn't matter what gender they happen to identify as. Even if they got a twigs and berry, but they don't actually identify that way. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's not your problem. Just because you are providing a service for these people or you make a, a cake for two women that want to get married or two men or whatever, you are not betraying your religious convictions. You are simply conducting business. And your religious beliefs or your perceived right to, to, to push your religious beliefs in your business, they don't trump civil liberties. Everybody has a right to do business 
with every company. And that's where I don't, I, I keep, I, this drives me absolutely nuts. And of course, you know, all of this started back with the, uh, the Bakers. I forget which state it was in, but mm -hmm. they just absolutely refused to do a wedding cake for this lesbian couple, and the lesbian couple sued them, and there was $150,000, $350,000 judgment or whatever. You know, my take on that is, look, you know, if you didn't want to do the cake, there are some very legal and subtle ways to, to not do the cake. Mm -hmm. Just say, I'm booked. I can't get to it. Or you price that damn cake so freaking high that they don't want to do, they don't want to buy the cake from you. But these folks had to know what they were doing when they stuck their foot in it and said, you know what? I don't believe in same-sex couples getting married. I don't condone it, so I'm not going to make you a cake. Well, I'm sorry, but that's the same thing as if a black person were to walk in there and they said, you know what? I don't believe that black people should have the right as citizens, so I'm not, I'm not making you a cake either. To me, there's no distinction between the two. Now, from someone with your point of view, and I, and I understand you have more of a, I would say more of a <laughs> liberal religious point of view than the people that are doing this. What are your thoughts on all these states trying to pass these ridiculous laws? Uh, what what did because things get a bit more difficult for me on this end of the spectrum. You I I guess the best way of saying it is you don't have skin in the game, so you don't have to deal with some of the things I mentally have to deal with with stuff like this to where it's not exactly completely black and white in my head. I never I never get comfortable with a law being made with a religious thought in mind, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because being someone that works in ministry work and stuff, I have been to a bunch of churches. I've been to a bunch of gathering places. I have been to Baptist places, Church of God, all, all of these different types of gathering places. I've been there, and I've seen the different sex, I believe is what we would call them, of Christianity. Mm -hmm. I always get worried about this sort of thing because— and I've even joked about this on Gig, so I do not have problems joking about it on this show either. Some of the things that I believe in terms of biblical principle and stuff would get me burned around here if someone <laughs> knew what we were talking about. If we bring up Adam and Eve, we're already people are going to start going, burn the witches! So <laughs> we won't get into that, but I'm just saying, although you can find out TSC and .tv slash gig if you want to find out why the witches would want to be burnt. Um, but but no, it is, it is one of those things where the main thing that strikes me, even not necessarily just in this specific situation, but I never like laws being made out of anything specifically religious. Yeah. Because there are so many, there's so many different interpretations of Christianity at this point, quite a few that I disagree with as a Christian, that I inevitably there is going to be some sort of bias to a specific way of thinking. Mm-hmm. I suppose is the best way of putting it, right? So it's not even me necessarily saying that my faith has no place in the government. It's just that I know that anything that would be, I'm putting quotes on this, faith-based right. would actually be religion-based. Right. And I have a very distinctive distinction. <laughs> I don't know why I had to use that word twice. <laughs> I have a very specific distinction between spiritual and religious. Most of the time, religion, I'm going to piss some people off, but here <laughs> we go. Most of the time, religion is based on what some, and this is my stereotype. I don't actually mean this, but this is the best way that I figured out to get it across. Some fat dude in a suit made a bunch of rules because he read something a certain way. Yeah. And as a result, that's what their entire faith is. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, <clears throat> as opposed to taking the text itself, giving historical context, not just using the book itself, but also using historical context, doing some extra study, figuring out what 
so, so socioeconomically mm-hmm. this was referring to at the time. Why did that happen? Why did that happen? What was that letter referring to? Why is that letter not telling you not to get a tattoo ever and it was just in this specific situation? Things like that are subtleties that quite often get missed when it comes to this sort of thing. Now, disagreeing with homosexuality, we could get into that. We probably don't need to. No, no. I mean, I I don't think that's really the point. But that doesn't mean you have to be... The way I've always put it is, you can disagree with someone and stand firm. I'm not saying back off, Mm -hmm. right? Either side of this situation. I'm not saying back off, but I'm saying you can still stand firm and not be a jerk, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. So there are very subtle ways for you to refuse service, like you said. I mean, I, and I've, I've always had a bit of a struggle with this because a person owns their business. So in technicality, yes, but at the same time, no, it's, it's, it's not exactly black and white for me. It's this, it's this shade of gray that just kind of blurs together with me and makes my nose start to bleed if I think about it too much, right? Because because I'm always about someone having their freedoms and stuff like sure. that. Then other things cross over with that, and it it sort of becomes a jumbled mess in my head, and I can't really untangle the knots. But see, the way I look at it is, you know, I I I understand what you're saying. It's like, hey, this is my business. I have I have certain freedoms in this country uh, to own this business and to run this business as I see fit to make a profit. It's my livelihood, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, we have laws in this country, uh, you know, civil rights, civil liberties and all, that are there for the common good of everyone. Because if you didn't have those there, you would have people cherry picking on, okay, well, I'm going to open up a a shoe business. I'm going to be a cobbler. Mm. Uh, but I'm only going to make shoes for people who have... Feet that are size six to nine and are only female. Mm. You can't do that because everybody has an expectation of the right to be able to conduct business without any bias. Now, we have that expectation. We still conduct business with people that have biases. I mean, that's that's just going to be the way it is. (laughs) Right. But. You know, and, and and to me, that goes back to what I said. I mean, uh, about, you know, race. Mm-hmm. If you decided that you wanted to be a cobbler, but you're only, go- hey, you're only going to make shoes for black people. That's racist. You can't do that. <laughs> Even though in this day and age, that's, that's reverse racism. But anyway, the point being, you flip flop in any way you look at it. Now, granted, mm-hmm. it, one way. There's going to be less noise than there would be the other way. I mean, right. we're still, we are still infantile when it comes to uh, to, to humankind and and how <laughs> how old we are and how we deal with situations. Right. Um, I am of the mindset, and I've said this before, that no law, especially if you're in a country that is supposed to have freedom for everyone. To live a life the way they want, they, they so choose, as long as it doesn't encroach on anyone else, else's rights to live their life the way they want to. All your laws have to be neutral-based, meaning they can't have anything to do with religion whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Because as soon as you make one law that has a bias toward one religion— now you've just upset the apple cart with this other group of people over here who are now bitching and moaning about the fact that that's not fair. That's the things they need to understand about these religious freedom bills that they're trying to mm. push through. Most of them basically, the one in Georgia was so broad that it essentially said, look, if you believe this and it's against your beliefs, you're now in a protected class. And I went, so that means any Muslim who believes in Sharia law can come in and do the same damn thing. Let that happen. Mm. Let that happen and and see who brings <laughs> out the pitchforks. Right. So it's best just to not have any of it. 
Mm. You have a basic right to believe and practice the way you want per the First Amendment. That's all you ever need. Because what we're pretty much talking about at this point isn't even a person having a belief and using it. What we're talking about at this point is the possibility of government getting involved. And I've I've never liked government getting involved with things that I hold – I'm going to say religious beliefs. I don't like using that word, but, but things that I hold my spiritual beliefs in. Sure. Um, the <laughs> – Oh, I'm going about I'm about to pour some more hot water. The whole marriage system. I'm not even talking about gay marriage. I'm talking about marriage, period. Yeah. The fact that it's a governmental tax code and everything is ridiculous to me because then all of a sudden this means that you've got to in some cases pay money yep. to get married. Yep. You've got to pay money to you should have probably thought about this before the next step I'm about to come out happens. But if you, if God forbid, say you were in a abusive relationship or something and needed to get a divorce, you now have to pay hundreds of dollars to get that divorce. That way they sign up one paper inside of an office somewhere saying, okay, they're divorced now, you know, and things like that. And it's, it's always been ridiculous to me when the, the whole, if you look back at the origin of the practice mm -hmm. and stuff like that, it makes no freaking sense now. No, so, it doesn't. So, so we have this whole debate about that type of marriage. And meanwhile, I'm the one going, I don't even agree with the straight <laughs> yeah. variation of I like this. that. It's like, the heck with the, with the gay marriage. I don't even approve of the, the standard marriage. What's going on here? <laughs> right. It just being a governmental yeah. system has always gotten my goat, I suppose, because it's it's taken what was supposed to be the uh, way of someone proclaiming that they were going to join with this person forever. And it's uh, it's lovely, romantic stuff mm -hmm. like that and turned it into a tax code. Yeah. But then that's what most people see it as. Most people don't even – there are people that live together and eventually say, should we just get the tax code? Yeah, let's get the tax code. So as a technicality, they get married. Mm -hmm. I mean this is, this is what marriage has pretty much been reduced to is that people think it's a tax code. It's not even important to anyone anymore. And, and you know me. I'm a hopeless romantic, so that kind of makes me twinge a little bit when I think about it where it's like – Oh, there's no romance in it anymore, and it, it just it just feels bad, man. <laughs> yeah, our uh, <clears throat> our producer pointed out here in uh, in chat. He said, "Marriage as a government institution with tax breaks was supposed to aid in strengthening family unit bonds and therefore strengthen the country as a whole." And apparently, that's an argument that a uh, a Catholic friend, a former Catholic friend, made once upon a time. But and and I don't know. I mean, I guess I could see that. But I also look at the fact that, you know, it. I'm thinking of like hand fasting. Hand fasting is a um, it is basically a way of getting married uh, through the. Uh, oh God, I can't remember. Not the Druids, but the uh, pagans. Mm. It's a it's the pagan uh, marriage ritual, and to me, it makes all the sense in the world. You, you basically, you take your hands and they wrap like some special uh, sacred um, cloth around or whatever. There's a few words spoken and you are betrothed, if you will, to one another for a year. Mm. You come back at the end of that year and if you want to do it again, then you stay together. But if after that first, you know, after that year, you're like, he snores, I don't, I don't <laughs> want to be here anymore, then... You could go your separate ways, no harm, no foul. But every year you would come back and basically reaffirm those those vows, if you will, renew them, if you will. A marriage subscription service. <laughs> Almost. And they, they even go so far as to have multiple partners, not in not necessarily in the sexual context, but what makes sense for the family unit. You know, you've got two people that are actually working and bringing money into the household. There are children involved. You've got another person who stays home, takes care of the kids, and, and does the cooking and cleaning. You know, if they like to bone each other, okay, fine, <laughs> whatever. You know, that's nobody's business. Uh, yeah. But, and, and honestly, the whole 
only the the whole polygamy thing is also a governmental issue. Mm-hmm. You look in the Bible. How many wives do a lot of those men have? <laughs> those those are fascinating circumstances. <laughs> well, it it is, and it's also very male centric too, mm-hmm. because not nope. you don't ever see a, a woman in there with like multiple husbands, or at least I don't recall. I could be wrong, but uh, most of the time it's very male dominated. That yeah, I'm gonna have ten wives and. <laughs> you know. Yeah, that that was the culture at the time. Let's put That's it that true. way. So That's true. That was, I, I don't disagree with that. That was mostly pre-Christianity, actually. I think if I'm not, I'm di- I'm I'm having to think of the timeline to remember if I remember any of them being multiple partnered after Christianity actually. Oh well, that's that's well. That's they a also study for later. <laughs> they also live nine hundred years. Also, and that's not. <clears throat> I know that's not accurate either. That's just the way time was was told at that that point in time. But anyway, point being, I mean, you made some very good points, which is interesting. I never thought that you would really view it that way. But uh, as far as you know, it's the whole tax and governmental aspect of it. Like here we are arguing over the fact of whether Steve and S- Steve and Mike should have the ability to legally get married and and have the tax benefits and you're going, you know what? I don't even like the fact that, you know, Margaret and Steve <laughs> need to do it. So Right, yeah. All right, that's pretty cool. Oh man, you got anything else you want to talk about or we wanna Want to I wrap it up we, for today? I think we can wrap it up after that. We've we've said enough things to tick various people off today. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a small group gathering out my door right now, and I'm pretty sure I saw three or four pitchforks. So, <laughs> but that's that's okay. All right, well, that's going to wrap it up for today's wide open talk show. We appreciate your time and joining us. Hopefully, you could join us live, and if you did, we'd appreciate it if. Uh, you give us a call, 229-518-3525, and share your opinions on any and everything that uh, that we talk about during the show. Or if you've got something else you want to talk about, that's that's great, too. Um, Sam, you got anything you want to plug? Uh, just that you can find all of my stuff at tscn.tv or find me more personally at about.me slash labtech7. That's all the stuff. <laughs> all right. Sounds good. Uh, and you can find pretty much everything I'm doing right now at slant.fm or uh, social media stuff is over at about.me slash gdadkissing. We will do our best to be back tomorrow, uh, Wednesday. Tomorrow's Wednesday. Yes. Tomorrow, yes. Wednesday, <laughs> which will be April the 6th around 2 p.m. live streaming this. So come and join us. Give us a call, and we'll see you then. Take care. Bye-bye. show is a production of the Slant FM Digital Network. Find more at slant.fm.